Hey guys, it's Edward. So today I'm going to do another system design problem. In my last video, I showed you a very simple example and used my step by step approach to show that my process of iterating and identifying inefficient points works to solve any system design problem. If you haven't watched the previous video in the series, I'll link them below. In this video, I will do a more complicated problem. I'll perform this as if I was doing an actual system design interview and go a bit faster. I won't be as explicit about asking myself the inefficiencies, but I'll point out these decision points occasionally. So with that, let's begin. Now let's solve the problem, design a almost real time light counter. We'll start off with our basic minimum viable product, some calculations, functional and non-functional requirements. For the minimum viable product, we expect that a user will read a post with likes and that the post will update likes in real time. The user space we expect to handle is around 1 billion daily active users. Think of this in terms of Facebook scale. The number of connections we expect to service will be based on how often people like and see posts. Now with 1 billion users, a few issues arise. A user may be scrolling, but may not be highly engaged with a lot of the content. Therefore, the liking to post ratio will be actually very small, maybe a 1% or so for a guesstimation. You can actually interpret this as our read to write ratio. Functionally, we expect the users to keep updates to a post, maybe even as a subscription or as a long poll. Keep this in mind that for now, we will model the users looking at a post as a subscription. This may change later on, but for now, it'll suffice. In the non-functional category, we know we want to do a scalable distributed system. Using the cap theorem as guidance, we choose to have availability and partition or AP here and make things eventually consistent in exchange for 100% uptime. This is because likes are not 100% core to the functionality. We are okay with the numbers being slightly off as long as people can have a highly available system. Conversely, if we had chosen to use consistency and partition out of the cap theorem, then if a node goes down, then we lose all the like data and will not be able to populate the posts at some point. Users will not be happy in this situation. Now that we have that, let's shift gears and start developing our system. Let's start with representing a basic like. A user will like the post. The post then gets updated with that action. So how do we want to represent this in our system? Namely, how will we want to store that like and post? We can start off something simple like this with the post database and then the post ID and then the list of users that have liked the post. But it, the issue here is that we are constantly maintaining this list of users and we'll end up in a lot of deadlock for that post row or that database. After all, if a post gets high engagement, then that entire table and row will constantly be updated with reads and writes and will be choked as we update and query for those same likes. It's not great and it will actually impact our ability to retrieve other posts in that same database or table. A better solution would be to separate the likes and posts into two separate databases in this next row where posts have an ID and comments and there is a separate database for likes where there's a user ID and a post ID that represent the liked post and what user liked it. This is better, but it implies that if we want to even get the number of likes on a post, we have to hit the like database over and over again. This is pretty much the same problem as before because every single query to the post necessitates a query for all its likes. So instead, in the spirit of eventual consistency, let's use some form of caching here. We can cache the previous calculation of likes to a post and then eventually update that value with a new number of likes from this likes database. So our schema would look more like a post database with ID, comments, and number of likes. And then the like database would have user ID and then the post ID from before. We can then create a service that will occasionally query the likes database or receive a batch of the changed posts. This will then run an update to the post database with the new number of likes. This is probably the fastest we can get. A user will query for the post and receive some initial data. Then those likes will eventually be up to date depending on how frequently that service will be run. So let's at least complete the user story for submitting a like. The user will like a post. The web server might talk to a user database to authenticate. With the like API, it will go to a like service, which will then submit this into a like database. Eventually, the aggregation service will update the post database over here. The biggest pain point now is the sheer number of posts that we have 
and the data. To handle this, we will need to shard the data. But how will we do this? Certain posts will be very hot and very popular, while others are not, and the more recent the post is, the higher the chance of engagement. But each post ID has an equal chance of belonging to a popular celebrity or someone who's likely to get a lot of engagement. So this means that we can actually shard the data by an alphanumeric ID range, depending on the number of shards that we want to have. After all of this activity of recording and handling like states, we need to publish the new like event here. Remember, per one of our stated assumptions that there is an active subscription for those likes per post, we can do this with an aptly named post update service. This post update service will publish the new event via the post ID and send this to whatever subscription wants the post ID. With a high volume of likes, this can actually jam our pipe. We could then batch the number of likes per post and make this experience a bit more manageable. That is, we wait until maybe 10 or 15 events for post ID A before actually passing it through to the pipeline and distributing it to the subscriptions. But more likely, we will need to have multiple pipelines. We can use a load balancer here and split the load across pipelines the same way we sharded by alphanumeric IDs. That way, one pipeline can be responsible for the first N IDs, the second pipeline can be responsible for the next N, and so on. Now let's handle the other side of this interaction, a consumer, a person who wants to view posts and has an active subscription to a lot of posts. In this case, we could have an individual user keep track of all their subscriptions, but this might be too much responsibility to bear. How could we manage which subscriptions are active or not? What if the user decides to restart the app? Should we remove all its active subscriptions? It's not immediately clear. This is where we might instead have a user session that actually keeps track of the posts that the user is subscribed to at that particular time, and those subscriptions will have a relevant list of post IDs. Every time a user logs in and interacts with the app, a new user session may be created or restored, and any subscriptions the user is plugged into via a like, they should receive those updates for. Given all this, the best way to model this would be to do a subscription for those posts. A user likes a post, then begins receiving live data, and then when they unlike it, they will stop receiving that data. We have a few mechanisms that we can use to actually implement this, like I mentioned before, via pushes or long poles. Pushes are great for being reactive, but they don't necessarily guarantee updates on the front end or mobile side. The goal here is to keep a user's attention for as long as possible whilst they are engaged with the post or the app. So to keep them inundated with clear and guaranteed interactions is vital. Therefore, web sockets and long poles that retain the connection are the way to go. This allows us to guarantee a long and responsive connection. Now this will consume resources and holding on to 1 billion or so connections is very expensive. So for users who are no longer subscribed, whether it is because they have scrolled the post off the screen or have exited the app, we can disconnect the connection. This architectural decision also has a secondary effect of receiving live comments as well. We can just use the exact same channels but connected to a different database, like a comment database over here. It's beyond the scope of this problem, but it's worth mentioning because viewing comments is something that naturally comes with view posts and you'll get extra brownie points from the interviewer by mentioning this. These subscriptions will read the stream of likes and activities that are coming in and publish those likes to all the subscriptions of the post. As a secondary effect, it will also do a fan out policy for all the popular posts. Finally, let's actually talk about caching. How can we use caching to improve the performance of the system? So far, despite our service optimizations, we are still hammering the database quite frequently. But let's consider the end user. They are more likely to engage asymmetrically with more popular posts than with non-popular posts. Therefore, we can cache hot posts and avoid hitting the database so many times right over here. If we zoom out and look at this entire system that we've constructed as a whole, we can see there are two things that we can cache, the posts themselves and the user interactions. First, the posts. How should we cache them? We may think of this as a simple key value store, and it might be enough, but chances are we will need to split and replicate the cache for multiple connections to read from in a distributed cache. After all, hitting the exact same RAM stick on the exact same server for er, a single cache probably isn't going to cut it for the high volume of traffic we have. Imagine Kanye drops an album and then we cache that post. All 1 billion users will be hitting that exact same cache for the exact same post. While we don't suffer as high a penalty as hitting the database directly, we'll still end up relatively choking. No one component can handle all that power. 
This is where we may need to use a distributed cache like Redis. Whenever a post gets updated, we will have a fan out where one post needs to publish to a bunch of other subscribers. Or in this case, where one cache receives the update and then a bunch of other caches will receive the update through that one cache. The other thing we can cache here is the user sessions themselves. We can actually put this on the user side. Yes, I did say that handling subscriptions individually and subscribing and unsubscribing would be a bit messy, but if we can segment these into individual sessions, then our process may become easier. A user gets a session ID and sees if it's active. If it is, then we retrieve the post we subscribe to. If not, then we will just ignore all the other sessions and start a new entity in the cache. We can then get even fancier and stop sessions when the user has scrolled far enough away or switches apps. Since these subscriptions are short-lived and change very frequently, we don't actually need to commit all these user sessions to a database. We can even keep a copy of the user ID and the latest session in a cache on the server side as well. For 1 billion daily active users, there's not really a way that we can manage all the subscriptions for every single user at all times on our server. Therefore, we may only want to cache the sessions of highly active users. And the policy that we can use to handle this would probably be an LRU system. Now, let's actually talk about metrics here. This is often a forgotten child of system design, but it's nevertheless important. How will we monitor the health of the system and let the on-call know that a situation has transpired? How are we going to measure the success of whatever we are creating here? There are a few situations that we need to handle. We may want to check up on the number of connections or subscriptions we have. This will help us better expand and contract the number of pipelines we need to have in the future. Another is to make sure all the systems are running, even at times of low activity. This may mean injecting dummy requests and events into the system in order to ensure it's being populated and it's still running. This is a common technique for battle hardening a system to ensure that it's not buggy. Finally, we want to consider the PMs and the business side of things. How many people are actually using the product and how many users are actually opting out of it? This is how we can check the efficacy of whatever product we are using and creating because at the end of the day, it isn't just engineers at the table who are helping us with this product. There are multiple stakeholders who need to be satisfied as well. Now that I've showed you my proposed answer, let's actually see what one client wrote. So much like the data structures and algorithms section, let's take the delta between what he did and what the solution is and see if we can track where he went wrong. Our goal here isn't just to see the answer difference. Rather, we want to see how we can adjust our approach and get the same answer the book does, or in this case, the answer that I've given you as the key. And we do this by looking at our answer and then the answer key. We wanna ask ourselves, what were the questions and considerations that the book did? And can we also become privy to those as well ourselves? Firstly, his functional and non-functional requirement look similar, but are not as atomic as we'd like. I do like the near real-time clarification for latency tolerance, and I think that is something that I could have personally done as well in my answer. The estimates are also pretty reasonable. However, one detail that is lacking is the cap theorem, and I think that it would have given him a better compass to follow. After all, the cap theorem is just a very easy theorem that in general applies to a lot of the engineering problems and a lot of the system design problems that you will do. Furthermore, I would like to see him specify why the system is being built, and I want to see him have specifically said high availability. These are small details that I think can help him with future problems because, again, these serve as a north star, like tools that you can pull out or a way to follow, and it gives you some direction in which you want to build a system, and I think that he should incorporate them. But overall, his initial start is fine, but there are some little signs there that are bothering me a little bit. Next. You can see on the left hand side that he is simulating a user post. I'm a little confused here as to what the web server to post view means. I think this is his minimum viable product, but it looks like he tried to directly fetch the posts from a service and the number of likes associated with the post. This really isn't a good answer. The reason why is because it's not detailed. The next logical question to the way he's designed this is how does the post view work? because the way it's drawn and presented now, there is no connection between the like service and the post view. This may or may not be the case, but to hand wave it without a proof or some details is sloppy. After this, we see a more fleshed out version, but it still kind of falls a bit flat. He seems to have wrapped the equivalent of our like, post, and aggregate service all into this one box called web service, which then fetches the post. He then publishes the post in the pipeline and that seems to have all the databases codependent in some way. 
This is similar to what we're doing, but again, it lacks a lot of the details that are necessary for the problem. What it specifically lacks is the individual responsibility that each one of these databases provides, because right now, it just acts like one big monolith. What we really want to do is express why we have each individual item there and how do these services work in tandem. Can these pipelines actually support the type of operations that he's thinking about? And it's not clear from this diagram because everything just kind of melds into one big mesh. So already we see the repeated mistake of not specifying enough details on how the flow of information should work. We also don't see how the components interact. This leads me to believe that he did not build the system in a logical manner from the ground up, that he just kind of threw these components that were seemingly relevant and then hoped that they would eventually grow an answer out from themselves. Therefore, the actionable feedback that I would give him is to ask how every step he takes solves the problem at hand and how all these components actually work together and what each individual responsibility of each component is focus on evolving the system from a very basic system to a more complex, scalable one. So I hope you found this example and evaluation useful. In the next video, I'll review some tips and closing remarks on the entire series and how you may be able to use these techniques you learn for your coding interview in your actual career. So that'll do for me. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Also, feel free to follow me on my socials where you can vote for what topic I cover next. And if you want to try and secure your next job offer, you can book me for interview coaching at eChantech.com. If you like this video, please like and subscribe, and I'll see you all in the next one.